Welcome to the ISO Show, dispelling myths and sharing tips for success to improve your business with ISO standards with your host, Mel Blackmore. Hi, and welcome to the ISO Show. Thanks very much for joining me today. Well, I'm delighted to be joined uh, by our guest, Will Richardson, who's the founder and CEO of Green Element and also Compare Your Footprint. Uh, welcome, Will. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me on the show. Great to have you. And uh, yeah, before we dive into you know, what Green Element does and benchmarking carbon and, and energy for an organisation, which I know that's what we're going to be diving into. And also listen to some of your controversial views on offsetting as well, which I'm looking forward to diving into. Could you just share with us a bit of background about, you know, um, how did you get involved with energy and carbon management? I guess it started off with my undergraduate degree in my very early 20s. And I did actually did a thesis on how people perceive the effect they have on the environment whilst partaking in sports within the Cairngorm region. And it was in a hospitality management degree. And I didn't at the time know that I was interested in sustainability, but I clearly was because I was told to write a thesis on something that we were interested in. And weirdly, I now live in Scotland and work in sustainability. So it was almost like I was preempting myself. So I think I think that and the fact that growing up, picking up litter, my gran used to take us for walks and pick up quite a lot of litter. And I came from a fairly environmental family, but much more on a pragmatic style rather than a hippie style, I guess. So could you just explain, you know, how, how did you start your business? Where did that all begin? I did a master's in environmental management for business back in the early 2000s and I'd had a variety of jobs prior to that in my 20s and I felt that it was probably the time I did something that was interesting to me and actually start to settle down rather than you know I was setting up bars and restaurants in Chile and taxi driving in Thailand and couriering in London etc and it kind of went from there I did that master's and then started working for myself and we are here today. I didn't set set out to run a company. I didn't set out to do what I'm doing today, but I very much had a lifestyle business. I did a lot of kite surfing. I hung out with my friends who had had kids and um, the mums that were off work and go and hang out in playgrounds and just chat and have coffee and um, worked when I needed to. And then it started, I just got busier and busier. And I think back in the early 2000s, as you well know, sustainability wasn't a massive part of people's organisational lives. And I don't think I was aggressive in my sales either, to be honest with you, because that's not my personality. Although now we've got 20 plus people, I am much more aggressive in my sales because I have to pay for their salaries. So things have changed. <laughs> 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 so um, in terms of Green Element, I know that you offer a wide range of services, but would you mind just um, providing an overview on, on what your company does then, please, Will? Of course. We, in essence, help organisations become more environmental. By doing that, we um, work on the carbon footprint of an organisation. If you're someone like Finisterre, who have products like jackets we'll look at the carbon footprint of their products um, so do a lot of life cycle analysis work we work on science-based targets we just really try and help organizations become more sustainable through a variety of different means and um, tools within that of which can pay footprint which is the carbon reporting software is a part of that tool set Okay, great. Um, I'd just like to unpick a couple of those areas then. You mentioned about the product life cycle. So a lot of organisations are looking at becoming carbon neutral right now. And one of the things that they need to look at, obviously, if they've got a product, 
is what is the life cycle of that product, but also organisations that are service-based businesses also need to look at, at the life cycle there too. Could you just share with me, you know, what are the main differences between looking at life cycle anal analysis for products versus services? Of course, a really good example of this would be Cafe Direct. So Cafe Direct have fields, plantations in Peru, where they grow their coffee and then they bring that coffee and the coffee beans over to the UK where they go through the coffee bean process and then that's turned into the coffee that we see on the shelves in say Tesco's and other organisations and then you're looking at boiling the water and drinking the coffee and so we looked at the carbon footprint, the impact from literally growing those coffee beans through to boiling that kettle. And it helped Cafe Direct understand the full life cycle of that product and how much of an effect it has on the environment. So that, that's beginning with sourcing raw materials, packaging, transportation, the manufacturing of the goods, etc. So how long does that typically take for an organisation to be able to do that? Depends how big the product you're particularly doing. So Cafe Directs took quite a long time because of the amount of, as you quite rightly pointed out, which I didn't, the, you know, you've got the packaging and you've got all of the other stuff. So there's a lot of intricate details that was needed to be looked at within that particular project. But if you're looking at, say, a T-shirt, then, then it's slightly easier to look at because there's less that goes into that particular product and yeah so it usually takes longer if we can't access the data it's all about the data it's all about trying to um, get accurate information in order to make the calculations that you need to in order to perform that service so talking about those calculations then I know that you've got a, a mechanism that you have at Green Element, compare your footprint, which, which enables an organisation to understand their carbon footprint, I believe, and then benchmark against it. Is that right, Will? Yeah, so there are two ways to look at um, carbon footprinting. There's the organisational footprint, which would sit within a product cycle um, footprint. So, for example, if, you're, if we're going back to that Cafe Direct, we would need to be understanding the energy that's used in the, say, office, because that is a part of the process that you're looking at with that particular process. So, but an organisational footprint is really quite simple when, when it comes down to it, because there's less to it with regards to the fact that you're not looking at such a long supply chain. And we are looking at your scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. And I'm assuming that, that you, the listener, understands what it is that um, I'm talking about there. But um, in a nutshell, scope one and scope two is indirect and direct emissions. So you've got your electricity in scope two and you've got your gas that you are burning in your office, diesel, petrol in your vehicles that you are burning in order to get to that destination and your air conditioning units that you are using that gas in order to cool down your building. And therefore that's direct emissions. And then scope three is everything else really. So we're looking at your, your business travel and your packaging that you have bought or your transportation downstream or your, you know, your buildings. And, and it's, it's really useful to know that your scope three emissions are someone else's scope one and two emissions. So when they came out with this whole carbon strategy, they rather naively in hindsight, and I think I think in hindsight rather than I think I probably would have felt the same as them, that they thought that if everyone captured their scope one and two emissions, then why do you need to capture any of your scope three? Because when you're flying from London to New York and of course you won't be doing that because you'll be trying to reduce but let's pretend that you're doing that that aviation fuel that you're putting into that flight is that company's scope one emissions so if they were capturing and everything went into a pool then everyone's 
we would be capturing the emissions from all around the world. So it's almost like we're double counting now, which does make me feel that potentially there's quite a lot of positivity that's in sight because we're actually almost making the situation look worse possibly than it actually is and i don't know if that's the positive side of me thinking that and i i'm probably going to be damned and shouted at by possibly some members of my team for saying stuff like that but i i think we all always need to look at the positive side of life and try and think that the best will happen yeah it, it is such a gray area isn't it when we're looking at scope three emissions and as you say you know are, are we double counting and it could look worse than it is but I think at this stage in the game, businesses are still trying to understand what their energy consumption actually is across their organisation. What does that result in terms of GHG gas emissions? So in terms of the benchmarking then, so I know that you are very much involved in benchmarking for organisations. Now, could you just explain this in a bit more detail, Will? I mean, is it going to be internal benchmarking? So obviously you might have an organisation that has multiple locations or multiple products that they're looking at benchmarking against. Or is it looking at it from a competitor's point of view? So let's say we were a law firm and we wanted to see where we were at in terms of performance compared to our competitors. Could you just kind of explain that in a bit more detail on how that can be used? Yeah, absolutely. And both both of your examples are valid and both of your examples are used extensively through Compare Your Footprint because if you're looking at um, all of your offices around the UK or alternatively all around the world, you'll want to benchmark those offices against each other. And the way that you benchmark one thing against another is by normalising your data. And when I say normalising your data, you use normalization factors like your meter squared of your office or how many full-time equivalent employees you have or your turnover or something else that you want to normalize against so you really just say if you're doing it against your meter squared you'd be looking at that carbon footprint and then dividing one by the other and then doing that across the board because if you're looking at say offices around then you'd probably want to do it by meter squared or um, FTE and remembering that different normalization factors can pull out different things so we had we actually had a client that was incredibly good at packing people in to their building in central London and if you looked at the SIBSI normalization factors which worked on meter squared then they looked horrendously bad for the environment because they had say 900 people in an office that potentially according to SIBSI should only have 400 people but it's not that they were doing anything illegal but what they were doing was they were maximizing the space that they had in that building and so therefore, in that instance, you should be looking at normalizing your data to what suits you. And you're not, you're not faking data, but what you're doing is you're trying to work out what the normality is against others. And you can do it internally, or as you say, with a law firm or any other organization, you can work out what your industry is, what you do, and then um, compare yourself to all of your competitors, which is what you can do when you go through the Compare Your Footprint carbon reporting tool. Um, you can actually benchmark yourself against others in a variety of different ways. Hmm, I think, you know, based on the fact that and many of our ISO show listeners are, are certified to environmental standards, such as ISO 14001 or ISO 50001, it's a great mechanism, isn't it, to be able to monitor progress because all of these ISO standards are based on, on continual improvement. So d does that um, help towards other energy data reporting, such as ESOS energy audit reports or SECR? How, how does it fit in with those other requirements, Will? I mean, you're not necessarily needing to benchmark within them, but they will absolutely, as you've quite rightly pointed out, will help you be able to know that you should be reducing. So if you see yourself on a graph and you see yourself um, halfway or three quarters of the way up and you see the companies that are right at the bottom, you're quite rightly will say to yourself, why are we, you know, 
that much up. We should be less. We should be doing it. So it's, I guess it's, it's an absolute mixture. And it's great that you've just brought in SECR, Streamlined Energy Carbon Reporting, and ESOS, the Energy Savings Opportunity Scheme, because they themselves are good mechanisms if they are done really well. And there are a lot of really good auditors out there that help with those reporting structure, the, that legal reporting structure that we need to be doing. And I urge anyone of you listening that if you do need to go through that, just make sure that you get a really good person that cares about how you're going to reduce. And it's not being seen as just a box ticking exercise. Because if you want to benchmark yourself from that box ticking exercise, then you're spending quite a lot of money with no returns. But if you were to be putting a lot of input and a lot of effort into that reporting structure, you will see a huge amount of return because of the reductions that you'll be able to do on the back of that data collection. And we've, I mean, we've been collecting um, timesheets and looking at how much time we spend on every single one of our projects for the last 15 years. And I know that 30% as a rule of thumb is data collection. And then it's about another 25% of data manipulation. So almost half the project is all about that data. And so what a waste of money if then you kind of stop there and you just spend the money. Why not actually spend a bit more time and possibly a bit more money, but you probably don't need to, actually looking at how you reduce that. And that in essence is actually a very small amount of your project because you've obviously got uh, meetings and all that kind of stuff that's that's within that whole thing. And you're looking at probably about 20% of your project that's on the reduction. So it's an easy part once you have that initial data. Absolutely, 100%. And I, I couldn't agree more because I, I think what we're finding is, is that many organisations are now starting to look at the benefits of verifying the energy consumption and carbon footprint so that they can actually then take action. Because otherwise, like you say, what's the point in doing that? If you're not actually going to gain the benefits from the potential impact of, of implementing those reductions, it's because it's not just the benefits to the environment, it's also bottom line, isn't it, in terms of profitability as well. So I think it's it's only in recent years that I think organisations are, are wising up to that and, and understanding that, yeah, well, if we are going to be going through this exercise of verification, we may as well do something with it to get, get the benefit from it. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. So I know that there's obviously quite a lot of greenwashing going on at the moment with organisations looking to be net carbon zero or carbon neutral. I mean, how do you interpret that, Will? I mean, what, what's your view on businesses being net carbon zero or carbon neutral? I think it's a slippery slope and I think that organisations need to accurately look at what it is that they are communicating to their stakeholders, be it clients, be it staff be it um, anyone that's working with them or for them because um, we're very quickly understanding the science behind carbon reductions and I think we're much more knowledgeable than we were 15-20 years ago we're much more knowledgeable than we were a year ago science-based targets initiative is an incredibly important part of this strategy and they are cutting edge when it comes down to understanding how to reduce your emissions in line with that critically 1.5 degree increase by 2030. And I think the fact that they are looking at that in itself, which is exactly why we are reducing those emissions. We are reducing our emissions because of climate change. And the science is telling us we need to reduce our emissions in line with that 1.5 degree increase. And then getting to real net zero by 2050. And if I may explain a bit about um, what the Science Based Targets Initiative are trying to achieve, they are asking you to reduce your emissions by roughly 60% by 2030. And then they've got a draft proposal out at the moment that is talking about how you're able to do that and what can be included within that. And they are saying that you need to reduce 90 to 95% of your emissions by 2050. And you're allowed to use 5 to 10% on carbon removals at that point. 
And of course, at the moment, carbon removals is an extremely expensive way of going through your reduction strategy. I mean, we're talking about offsetting as, say, £2 a tonne. We're looking at, what, I may be just chucking £800 a tonne. So it's a much more expensive system, but it's a much harder way to do it. And that's why they are pushing it out to the latter years, because they know at that point the reductions probably will have in price will have come down, but you're only looking at 5 to 10% of an organization's emissions. And it may be that you need to look at your whole business and your whole organization and what you do and how you do it. And I was chatting to a food company yesterday and they are looking at going down this route. And we've got one client that is signing up to Science Based Target, which is amazing because they are a food company and food companies are one of the harder companies to be going through the strategy, considering that offsetting will not be a part of that strategy. So therefore, anyone offsetting will have to include it in their corporate social responsibility, which is a very good reason to be doing it for, because you are helping, you know, plant trees or helping um, families in Africa by buying them stoves. It's a really important and integral part of sustainability as a whole because we are there to help each other. We as a world have to work with each other and have to help, but we have to understand that by doing some of that CSR work, it doesn't reduce your environmental impact. It helps people, but keeps that environmental impact at a level and actually because we have been looking at offsetting as a whole and as an industry for the last 15 20 years science is now looking and seeing that they can prove that actually the net impact of offsetting is negative i.e people's emissions are going up not down when they offset and it's because they're offsetting at such a quick point of their environmental journey so that's quite controversial really, isn't it? Because you, the, the both sides of the coin there, you've got an opportunity to act responsibly and to, you know, plant trees, get involved with other sustainability projects uh, in alignment with the F SDG, the Sustainable Development Goals, which you, obviously you, you don't want to discourage that. But the flip side of the coin is that you're saying that it's actually not making much difference to the global issue that we've got in terms of a global warming. So is, is, is that what you're saying then, Will? Yeah, so looking at the environmental side of things, yes, absolutely right. But looking at SDGs, then no. So the SDGs don't only incorporate the environmental world. They also incorporate social governance. And so therefore, it's a very complicated um, picture and we we love as humans to try and make it as simple as possible we're not going to make this simple it is complicated right so now we know it's complicated let's work with that complicated system and let's make it as best as we can possibly do it as an organization and offsetting companies have a place and they do have a place with where we are and what we're doing because what they're doing is very important and I can't stress that enough. It is a very important, but it is not a part of the environmental strategy. It's a part of your corporate and social governance. Interesting. Okay. Oh, fantastic. So I think that's been great to get your views and insights into many different aspects of energy and carbon management. And then obviously we just touched briefly then on, on the bigger picture in terms of, of SDG. So where can our listeners uh, find out more information about Green Element? So we've got two websites. We've got greenelement.co.uk and I think if you just Google Green Element, it'll come up. And likewise, compareyourfootprint.com. If you just Google compare your footprints, will come up. But do, by all means, um, my details are scattered around the internet now. Do contact me or any of the team. And we, if anything, can help you on that journey and help you with what it is that you're trying to achieve because we all need to be working together. We all need to be communicating how what we're doing and how we're doing it because it's a ticking time bomb and it really is. And I, um, and I hate being that dramatic and I cringe when people are dramatic to that degree. But I think that the faster that we all work together and reduce our impacts, the better the world will be. Absolutely, 100%. Well, thank you so much for your contribution on the podcast today. Uh, that's been 
been really interesting hearing your insights and, and opinions and, and finding out a bit more about the Green Element services as well. So thanks very much for joining us today, Will. Thank you very much for having me on. Thank you. Great. And thanks for our ISO show listeners uh, for joining us today. If you've enjoyed listening to this podcast and you would like to find out a bit more about environmental energy, carbon management standards, then please do uh, get in touch with us and leave us a review and any comments on any future topics that you'd like us to cover on the ISO show. So without further ado, I'll, uh, I look forward to catching up with you on the next ISO show. Looking to achieve certification to an ISO standard or just need a helping hand with ISO compliance? Contact us at blackmoorsuk.com 